Hello, and welcome to Talking About It, a podcast from New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm your host, Cindy Graziano. COVID is transforming every aspect of our lives in ways we could never have expected. And though vaccines have increased and some bans are lifted, we know that we are far from finishing this fight for our health. We must stay diligent and continue to ask how we can adapt in healthy and sustainable ways. This year, the New Canaan Abuse Prevention Partnership is dedicating its Talking About It podcasts to providing practical tips to manage the stresses of living in this difficult time. The psychological and physical health of everyone is at stake. And one critical takeaway from life during COVID pandemic is that we must learn new skills to better take care of ourselves and of course, each other. Our goal is to create an educational and open dialogue within the New Canaan community and beyond. In today's podcast, we will discuss stress and in particular stress in the sandwich generation. The people, predominantly women, but also some men, who are the primary caregivers to children at home and also to a parent or parents living with them at home. Since COVID, many families have had adult children move back home. And at the same time, they continue to care for that aging parent. About one in seven adults in the US are providing some financial assistance to both a parent and to children. And it's estimated that in 2020, leading into 2021, almost 30% of 25 to 34 year olds reside with their parents. The strategies and ideas we talk about today are what we are going to focus on in this podcast. We are fortunate that we have two panelists with us today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have Aggie, Aspenwall, who is at Latham Center. She's been there about 10 years, and in June of this year, she became the director. She is the mom of two adult children living at home since the pandemic, and she's the caregiver for her 94-year-old father. We also have Elaine McKenzie, and Elaine is a mom of five. Four children live at home, and they do have underlying medical conditions. She also cares for her 92-year-old mother who has dementia and requires 24-7 supervision. So to both of you, we welcome you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Let's start, first of all, with just the impact of being in the sandwich generation. We've defined it but we sometimes forget the impact that it really has. And I'm thinking about your priorities, vacations, even retirement. Aggie, why don't you kick us off? Okay, well, the food bill alone is, is a big impact in the house and, and the amount of cooking and dishes and um, you know every aspect of life is, um, is amplified. Uh, we also um, have the impact of all those personalities in the house together at the same time. And that is um, hard to deal with, but it also is interesting to watch. Understandable. Uh, the dynamics, the family dynamics. What about you, Elaine? How have you been impacted? Well, life was challenging before my mother came to live with us, just because, as you mentioned, I have um, chronically ill children and I'm ill myself. Um, and my son is homeschooled and he's been homeschooled for about six years. So there's been always sort of a hectic dynamic in our house, but manageable. Um, I also have a daughter with autism um, who requires constant supervision, but at, before COVID I had a caregiver helping me with her. So the demands were um, a little bit lightened. Um, but then when my mom came to live with us, um, and at that point, she was a little bit more independent than she is now. I could leave her for an hour or two and do errands or something. But about four years ago, that changed. And so now she really can't be home alone. Okay. So what was already sort of a tenuous situation became <laughs> even more demanding and stressful. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also a positive side of it, just being able to give back to my mom who gave 
so much to me growing up um, has made it all worth it. Mm. So if I understand correctly, Elaine, you have been in the sandwich generation for a while. When did you say? Six years. Six Six years. years. Yes. And so we want to think about that too, as far as how that changed the family dynamics based on what you've shared with us Mm -hmm. and the times of uncertainty right now that is Mm -hmm. all of us are are facing. I'm wondering, Elaine, if there are, could you explore with us a little bit more other difficult challenges you've experienced since pandemic? Since the pandemic? Yes. Well, that has intensified everything. Um, You know, number one, we are in very strict isolation and still are. We literally don't leave our house unless we go for a ride or a walk um, because we're fearful of getting COVID with our underlying conditions. So Mm. that in itself has been very isolating. And, you know, it it causes a lot of um, loneliness and sadness. Um, Mm. So that's number one that's been challenging. And as I mentioned, not having anyone Um, help in the home has been difficult because, you know, obviously we all need a little respite that we're not getting. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing that has really changed and which has caused me the most anxiety is the fear of one of us getting sick with COVID. Um, That's paramount. But number two is either my mother falling or some other Um, incident happening with my mom or one of us and then having to go to the hospital. That has been something that has kept me up at night uh, worrying about that because um, obviously I'm nervous about um, being hospitalized and risk getting COVID. But the other thing that has really been impactful on me and my family was originally during the pandemic, um, hospitals were not allowing Um, advocates or families to accompany their um, loved ones. And there's just no way that I could allow my daughter who has autism or my mom who, you know, can't hear and she with her memory issues. So that was traumatizing to all of us and sort of um, created this really larger than life anxiety. Sure. Well, we can hear the the concern there and yeah. I, both for your family and also as a director of, at the Latham Center, you probably hear and see things that are going on for folks during this time. How have you been impacted maybe differently since COVID-19? I think it's going to take a long time for the psychology of COVID to, to have people feel comfortable to congregate, even if it's in a a relatively safe situation where you're wearing masks and you're six feet apart. And even if you're vaccinated, I think um, people are still afraid. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's going to take, it's going to take a long time and we're not there yet um, anyways, but um, you can, you can see it um, affecting people to be afraid to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point we're going to have to, you know, try things and see how it goes and keep watching the numbers and keep watching what, what's happening and be aware of what's going on, yeah. Yeah, no, I think those are, are great insights from both of you just about the worry and concern that you're hearing, but also that you're faced with. I wondered about your children, since you have adult children, if your children worry, if they worry for you. Elaine, why don't you take that question? My kids definitely worry for me. Um, um, just given the fact that I don't get a break from my mom. Um, So they worry about that, but what they have done to help, um, help support me and to help occupy my mom is just so amazing to me. And just, um, I feel such gratitude toward my kids and my husband um, who take such good care of my mom, you know, in addition to me. And they'll play games with her, they do puzzles, they kid with her. Um, They're just so patient with her. And it's just remarkable to see and makes me so proud. That's, that's a great, great way to think of that. And Aggie, what about your children? Yes, my children are the same. They are amazing. And I think through COVID, they have seen what we have done for my parents, my father, 
and they've learned from it. Mm -hmm. They know this won't feel unnormal for them when I, when my husband and I get older. I think they they see the value in spending time with the your you know with your grandparent, and also um, they have learned and how to step up. And they can see when we're getting tired and they're like, well, I'll buy dinner tonight or, or I'll make dinner tonight. And you step out and, you know, take a walk or um, sit outside for a little while. They can see when um, you're, you're getting a little <laughs> over playing cards for the seven millionth time um, and they'll play a game with them. There are listeners that are anticipating that this might happen. In other words, they aren't in the sandwich generation today, but anticipate it. And I'm wondering if when you look back on how all of this evolved for the both of you, if you could share both what you did that was absolutely an excellent step to have taken now in hindsight, but also was there anything that you can share? Are there a few things you can share what you may have done differently, both mentally, physically. It's more than just finding a place for a parent or a child to sleep. There's so much more to this. So what did you do that you're glad you did, but also what would you have done slightly differently? Um, one of the things that I did is I started with someone uh, like two hours a week to mm. come in and start helping my mom and dad and was you know, doing a little cleaning, doing a little something that they couldn't do anymore. Um, and they got used to having someone else other than me be the primary caregiver. So, so during the day while I work, I have somebody come in and stay with my dad, but he would have never gone for this if he had not had the experience with this person before. So having, laying that down in the, before um, they even moved in, they were, they went up, she went up to the house with where they were when they were independent. And so they were comfortable with this person. It really helped. She is an, uh, a nurse practitioner. So she knows all the rules. So she's, I feel very comfortable having her come into the house and she's part of the family now. Um, and she knows like, she knows what he likes to eat. And you know, this just the level of comfort that made it so much easier for me knowing I could go to work and he was safe. Oh, that's a great example. Just easing into that. Easing in, yeah. yeah. Is there anything in retrospect you could have done slightly differently? I'm thinking about those listeners that are really about to go through this. Well, it's important to prepare, but you can't prepare for everything, but it's important to prepare so you can lay, lay down kind of the ground rules of the house too. Okay. When someone's coming in and saying, okay, well, this is, this is your area or this is, you know, and then, so you can lay out kind of the meals and the, and the, just the routine of life. And if they, they kind of meld into your routine a little better, if you, if you kind of lay it down for them. So that's what, that's what we kind of did with, with my dad, you know, we mm -hmm. kind of had it set up so that we knew how to, how he would process his day. Um, and, and that made it better for him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I can imagine some structure. Helped. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Elaine, thinking about how you prepared mm -hmm. what you did that you think really helped make these transitions. And again, your children were at home, but bringing in a parent, but also in hindsight, is there one thing you might have thought differently about? Well, I completely agree with Aggie. I think having that support, <clears throat> someone coming into the house to help is key. So I think, as Aggie has said, making people comfortable with someone that's going to step in your shoes when you're not there, I think is important. On a logistics standpoint, I um, put grab bars in the shower, sort of um, took away any throw rugs or area rugs that um, she could potentially trip on. I lowered her bed um, so she would have no, you know, wouldn't have difficulty getting in bed. So those are some of the practical things, putting railings on stairs, just, you know, making the house as safe as possible. And that obviously depends on the uh, independence or, you know, mobility level of the person that's coming to stay with you. Um, the other thing in hindsight that I didn't really think about, but I have been, is how difficult it was for my mother, even though she was so excited to come and live with us 
and she had just had her license taken away from her. So that's why she came to stay with us. Um, and she was thrilled. She loves my kids. She, you know, and all that. But it was probably really sad for her to have to give up her independence. And um, I probably should have talked to her more about that at that point. Um, so I think just being aware of, you know, it's a huge transition for the person um, that's going to be the caregiver, but certainly for the person that is um, the elderly person that's potentially losing their independence. Yeah. And you have to remember they're adults. You can't, you can't lay out their life like their kids and say, okay, now we're going to do this. And now we're going to do that. And I'm going to make you do this. And, and you can't, because they're not going to do it anyway. So you <laughs> kind of have to ask them if this is okay. Do you want to do it this way? You have to give them some power and some responsibilities. Before COVID, my dad's job was with the caregiver to go to the grocery store and pick up a few things. And he felt very useful. He felt mm -hmm. like he was helping the whole household. We need these eggs. We need this bread. We need this milk today. And he felt like he was doing his job. Um, and and, and it, that was important to give them, you know, their, their kind of responsibility and their choices of what they want to do because they are adults. You can't, you can't treat them like children, you know, and even adult children is the same thing. I don't expect okay. them to do something. I ask them if they will be, you know, willing to do it. I, you know, it's not, it's not their job to take care of my dad. Um, but sometimes I'll say, do you feel, do you feel like playing cards with dad tonight? You know, and if you don't, then I'll do it. But, you know, so, it, you know, it's kind of giving them the choices. You know, those are all great ideas. And it really shows that it is a team effort, <laughs> that it is a group <laughs> family effort. And I, I, I think that's a great way for all of us that are listening to remember that it's not always just falling on your shoulders. However, we know that you are the primary caregiver and while the family is learning resiliency and you have two, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about how you do manage your own stress, how you do find and carve out time to get your brain and your heart in a place that can continue because it is a 24 seven job. Elaine, why don't we start with you in giving us some of your tips or ideas on how to manage during these times? I think having a sense of humor is key. <laughs> um, my kids are funny naturally, so that helps, but just sort of seeing the humor in some of the absurd <laughs> things that may happen <laughs> definitely helps. Um, I find it very helpful to be able to talk to a friend or relative and sort of vent to them. Um, I think that support is essential. And I try to exercise when I can as well. I think that's um, really important just to get that stress out that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to carve out time for myself, to be honest with you right now, just because, you know, we're still being isolated and we're not leaving the home and not having anyone come in the home. So it is challenging for sure, for all of us, not just me. Um, so, but I think, you know, if you can prioritize your own self-care, that's crucial. And that regeneration is certainly key in keeping our emotions intact, the, whatever you might be feeling, the loneliness, the anxiety. Do you ever feel guilt? Is there ever a moment where you feel guilt having to do so much for so many? Well, I don't really feel guilty. I mean, sometimes I feel uh, maybe a little bit for my poor husband who's, <laughs> who's in the middle of this mess. Um, sometimes uh, he does all the cooking, so I'm very lucky. So um, I will I will try and give him a break and say, okay, you know, tonight we'll we'll I'll get dinner from you know somewhere and bring it home, or or um, you know we'll cook dinner and take a break, and because he does all the planning. He does all the lists for the grocery store. You know, that's that's his thing. Um, so sometimes I feel like we put a lot on him. But for everyone else, you know, not so much. I feel like we've done what we can do, the best we can do. Great. Sounds like a healthy approach. <laughs> so, you know, all of us have felt various forms of what you have gone through, although what you all are going through is much greater but we have had exhaustion and being overwhelmed. And these are great reminders, even for those that aren't necessarily in quote unquote, that uh, sandwich generation. So when you think about the future, 
Why is it so critical for everyone to stay diligent to mask wearing and six feet apart and all of that? Is that an obvious question or are there underlying reasons why it's important to the both of you for communities to stay diligent? Elaine, can you address that? Well, I think that because there's still so much uncertainty whether the vaccines are gonna cover the variants, I think it is just so important for people to keep wearing masks and not let their guard down. And that's my biggest fear, honestly, is that people are just, they've had it um, and they just want their freedom and they just want to resume the life that they had before. And I'm just very nervous about that. And we will remain um, cautious and at home until um, my entire family is vaccinated, which I'm not sure when that will be. Um, and then once there's some uh, data to support the safety of being able to you know, go out into public and what that looks like and what the protocols will be. And Aggie, do you echo those same concerns? I, I do. And I think that for me, wearing the mask is not so much protecting me, but it's protecting everybody else. You don't know what everybody else's situation is. You know, mm. some people can get vaccinated. Some people won't be able to get vaccinated because of health conditions or whatever, or allergic, whatever. Um, and so for me, I feel like it's my duty to protect other people to wear the mask and to, and to, to be diligent about staying safe. Now, I, I also think that there's got to be some form of getting back to normal life while they're reopening things. And we can, we can um, do it slowly and do it safely and watch. And we know how to go back to being locked down if we ever had to. So we know what to do there, but so we don't have to go there. I think it's important to stay safe and to wear your mask and to stay six feet apart and don't, uh, you know, and don't think that everything's fine because we're not there yet. So a couple of final questions for you. In many of our podcasts, we just discuss an issue as it directly impacts that person. But there are those that are indirectly impacted by situations, and your discussion today on the sandwich generation is an example of that. I'm thinking of family members and neighbors and friends. What can neighbors, friends, and family do to help? Those that really want to help, what does that look like for the two of you today? Well, um, before COVID, um, I had a friend who would offer to come sit with my mom uh, for an hour or two so I could go out. And um, my mother didn't love that, um, but just the gesture meant so much to me. Uh, when people call and just ask, you know, how we're all managing and do we need anything? I mean, whether I need anything or not, just that phone call is just so touching and so, uh, you know, so necessary. Um, what is crucial and doesn't happen a lot is people reaching out to the elderly person and just calling, FaceTiming, sending cards. I think they're often sort of forgotten by other people. And, you know, they suffer from depression and loneliness and sadness um, to the same degree. And I think um, any little bit that can be done to let them know that they're still loved and thought about, I think is helpful. It's helpful to that person and it's helpful to me as a caregiver. Um, and it makes me feel, um, just very happy when I know that um, my mom's feeling loved by not just us, but by others. At the end of this, what we're really looking at in the sandwich generation is that there are things that you can do to prepare. There are some things you can't necessarily prepare for. You can involve the whole family whenever possible to help manage your stress. You both talked about perhaps some meditation, carving out some time, finding ways to bring back some balance and friends and family reaching out to support and know that you are being thought of as well and that the community can do a better job and being diligent during this time, but also just reaching out in small ways that may have very significant impact. Is there anything else that you would like to share, either of you would like to share with our listeners today? Well, my, my, my dad, and my son have a special relationship and mm. my son will know all of his grandfather's stories. He, you know, he tells him all about time in Italy and growing up in Italy. And um, so that is, those are special moments that my son will have forever. Um, and 
the the other thing, like Elaine said, it's my dad after every meal and he loves to eat. After every meal, he thanks us for the meal. He thanks God for that we take care of him. He and every meal he thanks all of us. And it's it's like to see how grateful he is. And he did a lot for us growing up. He worked 24 seven when we were kids to um, give mm -hmm. us the best of everything. He deserves it. Mm -hmm. you know? Those are sweet, sweet stories. And it just, again, reinforces the need to have that family whenever possible and friends nearby. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for being with us today. And you've certainly highlighted both pre-COVID, but the particularly unique challenges during COVID in this new reality that we find ourselves in. And you've reminded us as individuals, but also as a community to remain diligent, if not only for ourselves, but for everyone around us, from the young that may be compromised to that elder parent needing special attention. Thank you both so much. Thank you. It is our pleasure to have you here. And to our listeners, we hope that you have enjoyed this podcast. And future episodes will continue to deal with perhaps adult children returning home for seniors living alone and a number of other topics as it relates to COVID-19. Talking About It is a community production from New Canaan, Connecticut. It is created by the New Canaan Abuse Prevention Partnership. D.D. Bartlett, founder, and produced by Robert Doran. It is supported by the New Canaan Community Foundation and many other organizations. If you or someone you suspect is in crisis, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. That's one 800 273-8255. To learn more about the subject discussed today and resources, you can find them on our website at talkingaboutit.org. And you can always listen to our podcast. The series will be broadcast on YouTube, talkingaboutit.org. Major podcasts such as Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts and on New Canaan Public Access Channel 79. We'll be back next month with a new episode of Talking About It. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>